Chapter 9 The rest of my first afternoon with Lilia passes quickly. She's thoroughly mastered the stay trick, but I can't coax her into doing more than hovering in the air for a few seconds. By the time Ari shows up, I'm completely frustrated, and Lilia is now ignoring me and trying to curl up and take a nap. So I see it's going well, Ari says dryly, taking one look at my face. This is the most stubborn dragon in the history of the world, I inform him. How is official seeker training? Pretty basic stuff for the second day, Ari says. We practiced sensing living beings with our gifts. Really? That's all? I've been doing that since I was five. Though maybe it's easier for me as a naturalist. I can see how someone with a warrior gift would have a harder time with it. Yeah, Ari says, shrugging. And I can tell he finds it easy, too. Seeger Agnar did share some useful tips, though. I can show you tonight if you want. I nod. Okay, and I was thinking maybe we should try to get Lilia out of the cave tonight. Maybe we could get her down to the beach? We might be able to get her to fly more easily if she has open air to maneuver. This cave is big, but it probably seems pretty small to a dragon. Good idea, he says. So you'll meet me on the beach when you can sneak away? Yeah, I... I stop. Thinking of sneaking away makes me realize that I have no idea what time it is. I run to the front of the cave and peer out into the opening to look at the sky. The sun's already setting. Oh no, I say. I think I'm going to be late. Dusk is still a way off, but I also have a long run to get home. Go ahead, Ari says. I can take it from here. Thanks, I say. See you tonight. Of course, I end up being late for dinner, and of course, Mama gets her revenge by keeping me busy with chores for the rest of the night. By the time Mama sends me and Eliza off to bed, I feel like I could sleep for a week. But I can't. I have more important things to do. Sneaking out of the hut is slightly less nerve-wracking this time, though it still takes forever for the rest of my family to fall asleep. Cold wind greets me as I creep outside, buttoning my coat tightly. The moon is large tonight, a few days shy of being full but it's mostly obscured by thick clouds, making it hard to see as I leap over the garden gate and run up the lane and over the hill. By the time I reach the beach, Ari has already lured Lily out of her cave. He's tossing berries and coaxing her to fly, but he's having little luck. I linger at the edge of the beach, planning to just watch them for a minute, but Lily senses my presence and runs over immediately. There are very few things that scare me, but the sight of a massive dragon with sharp teeth running towards me does, admittedly, make my heart race. Lilia stops just short of knocking me over and gives me a welcoming sniff. I pat her nose in greeting. How you doing, Lil? Ready to start flying? I think we have a defective dragon, Ari grumbles. She just won't do it. Maybe she's not ready. Maybe, Ari pauses. So, ready to train? Born ready. Ari tosses a few berries towards the other end of the beach, and Lilia bounds after them. That ought to keep her busy, for a second, at least. Okay, so... Sorry, I've never really taught anyone anything before. I'm not sure how to start. It's fine, I say. Just tell me what Seeker Agnar told the rest of you. Well, he talked about calling on your gift, which, of course, you already know how to do. But the part I liked was when he talked about rhythm. Rhythm? Like... Let me show you. Close your eyes. I give him a skeptical look, but follow his instructions. Now what? So, he explained it like this first. Just focus on yourself. Listen to the sound of your breathing. Focus on your heartbeat. You're supposed to get, like, in tune with your own natural rhythm. Um, okay? I feel a bit ridiculous just standing there with my eyes closed, but I try it anyway. I take a deep breath and listen to it. After a minute, I start to relax a little, and my breathing falls into a more even pattern. Now what? I whisper. Now do the same thing, but with what's around you. Let your gift spread out and try to find a rhythm in something nearby. And not fast, just a little at a time. I push my gift out, hovering only a few inches from my fingertips. But I don't feel anything. It takes a minute, just like when you were listening to your breathing. Just wait, Ari says. With a sigh, I close my eyes again. For a long moment, I still don't feel anything. But a tiny little pulse beats somewhere below me. I didn't feel it at first, but there is a rhythm to its life force. A tiny movement that vibrates the air. 
I feel something. Without opening your eyes, try to guess what it is, Ari says. Well, it's coming from the ground. I think it has a heartbeat, so it isn't a plant. It's it's moving pretty quickly over the rock, scurrying. Definitely an insect. A little one? Now open your eyes, Ari says. I look down at the ground. If I hadn't searched for the life force first, I never would have noticed the tiny beetle, whose coloring blends in with the rocks. I wouldn't have even known it was there. Whoa, I say. Pretty neat trick. But, um, I hope they don't expect us to do that every time we need to use our gifts to sense something, because that took forever. Ari laughs. I doubt it. Most of the guys in training couldn't even do it right. So that's it? That's the whole lesson? I mean, we spent the rest of the training just practicing sensing stuff. Seeker Agnar hit a bunch of plants around the arena, and we had to kind of scavenger hunt to find all of them. Not really something you need to practice, I guess, since you can already do that. Hmm. I'm not sure whether to believe Ari or not. How do I know if that's really what happened in training? What if he's holding out on me? Ari, of course, immediately senses my skepticism. His empathy gift at work, I'm sure. If you don't believe me, you can ask one of the other boys to train you instead. Although I don't think any of them has a secret dragon. I just may do that, I say. I'm starting to think your secret dragon is more trouble than she's worth. I nod towards Lilia, who's happily sniffing a boulder as if pondering eating it for dinner. Go ahead, then. Ari's tone is light. But don't expect any of the others to actually help you win the competition. I bristle. I could win it without your help. Thank you very much. You're not going to win. I'm going to win, Ari says. Coming from Johan or Thomas, this might have sounded mean. But Ari's grinning when he says it, and his tone is teasing, so I get that he's just trying to joke around. Still, I can't let that kind of comment go unchallenged. In your dreams, I say. Ari opens his mouth, but whatever he's about to say is cut off by a loud thud. Lilia, having thoroughly sniffed every inch of sand and rock on the beach, is now staring out at the sea and slamming her tail down against the ground, only to lift it and slam it back down again. Thud. 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 What are you doing, Lil? I yell as both Ari and I run toward her. The ground is trembling beneath our feet. She wants to fly out there, Ari says. It's probably some kind of instinct, knowing that there's food, and she's frustrated she can't get it. I can feel that. Sure enough, the yellow sparks of his gift are dancing around his fingertips. Can you calm her down? I ask. I can try. The light of his gift glows brighter. I need to quiet her down before... The other dragons, I say, tilting my head towards the sky. No, I mean the villagers. I thought they might hear... No, look, other dragons. There. I point straight upwards. The palest ray of moonlight illuminates the sky, and silhouetted against them are the unmistakable shapes of wings, tails, spikes, clawed feet. Whoa, Ari says. Fully grown dragons practically make Lilia look like an ordinary lizard. Their wingspan can be as long as 50 or 60 feet, and their bodies blot out the sky. I try to count their shadows, but it's hard to tell as they move so fast overhead. One, two, three. Beside me, Lilia makes a strange keening sound in her throat that I've never heard before. As I turn toward her, she leaps forward, claws scrabbling against the rocky beach. Her wings snap out, and with a few quick strides, she launches herself into the air. Yes! Ari shouts. She's doing it! He's right. Lilia isn't just hovering this time. She's flapping her wings hard, stretching her long neck forward, and trying to move faster and higher. She sways a little bit, trying to get the hang of it, her feet padding ungracefully in the air, like a dog trying to swim. As the larger dragons fly directly overhead, the sound of their wings pounding like drumbeats in our ears. Lilia finally manages to surge forward, getting closer to the cliffs. Ari and I whoop and cheer as she soars. It really, really worked. Our baby dragon has learned to fly. She's really going to... Look out, Lilia! Ari calls. And a second later, I see the problem. A second too late. Lilia's wild swinging tail slams into the cliff cliff face and snags on a tree. A bigger, stronger dragon could simply tug themselves free. 
but Lily is caught so off balance she nearly tumbles from the air, dropping rapidly. The tree snaps in half with a loud crack and is dragged down by Lily's weight as she plummets. I start to rush towards her, wanting to get help in some way, but Ari waves his arms frantically and stops me. We both scramble backwards as Lilia tumbles towards the beach. At the very last minute, she finds some balance, wings flapping wildly, and she manages to land on her feet with an ear-shaking stump that probably woke up the whole island, let alone the village. Vibrations tremble beneath us, knocking me to the ground. I stumble back to my feet and rush across the beach towards Lilia, who's shaking her head and looking dazed. Are you okay, Lilia? I ask, as if she'll answer me. I reach for her life spark with my gift. Ari's hands are glowing yellow with his. She's all right, he says. Not in pain, just confused. Maybe we should check her for injuries just in case. I approach her side and run my hand down her smooth scales. What, you don't trust my gift? I have to stop myself from saying, not really, out loud. As I rub Lilia's side, she twists her head around to look at me, and her yellow eyes are wide. It's okay, little dragon, I tell her. You almost got the hang of it. Just one more try, okay? The spines along her back slowly flutter downward as she relaxes. I wonder what it would be like to actually ride her. Seekers do it every day. She's not so tall yet. It really would be easy to... Hey, Ari, do you think she'd let us ride her? I don't turn to look at him, but I don't need to see his expression to sense his disapproval. Are you kidding? She just crash-landed, and you want to go for a ride? She didn't crash. She landed on her feet. A technicality. An important fact. Ari groans. You can't be serious. I don't mean she'd have to take us anywhere yet. I just wondered if she'd let us sit up there, even just while she's walking around. She's got to get used to us, right? If she's going to take us into the realm. I don't think now's the best time, Bryn. Ready, Lilia? I slide my hand as high up her side as I can reach, tightening my grip along her back, and haul myself up. Ari makes various disapproving noises as I swing my legs around, using the remaining ridge of one of her spines to steady myself. Lilia stays relatively still and doesn't make a sound, as if I'm no more than a butterfly landing on her back. I sit up straight and look down at Ari, whose mouth is hanging open. See? I say, more than a little smugly. But inwardly, I can't believe it. I'm really doing it. I'm sitting on a real, actual dragon, with real, smooth dragon scales beneath me. I wiggle around a little, resting against an indentation in her spine right above one of her spikes, my hands finding purchase on it. Do you want to walk around, Lilia? I say softly. Get used to me being up here for a little bit? In response, her wings snap open. Ari ducks, narrowly avoiding being hit in the face, and I grip her scales tighter to stay balanced. Um, let's take this slow, Lil... Her wings begin to move. Lilia? Abruptly, Ari leaps forward, grabs hold of her scales, and swings himself up behind me. If you're about to fly somewhere, I'm not missing this. Maybe we should rethink... I start, but I don't have time to finish. Lilia bounds forward, as if she were just waiting for both of us to climb aboard before she could take off. Her wings beat faster and faster. It's all Ari and I can do to cling to her back as Lilia launches herself into the air, leaving the beach far below with just a few beats of her massive wings. Ari yells something behind me, but the wind snatches his words away as we climb higher into the sky, higher than I've ever been in my entire life. Lilia turns in the direction that the larger dragons flew from earlier, the direction of their home. With Ari and me clinging to her back, our dragon heads straight for the Wild Realm. Chapter 10 Flying is incredible. I can't hear anything over the rush of wind in my ears and the steady beat of Lilia's wings, but I can feel everything. Lilia's scales beneath my hand, the cold mist in the air against my skin, the sensation of soaring, of going higher and higher and higher until there's nothing between me and the sky. Despite the dampness of the air, it's clear enough this night to get a good view. The only thing better than the feeling of flying is seeing the wild realm spread out below us, the landscape tinged with shades of deep blue, black, and gray, illuminated only by the moon and stars. 
I've only ever glimpsed these mountains from their base, but now Lilia flies us directly over them, and it's like we've entered another world. I've never seen the island like this before. It's even more stunning than I imagined. The landscape is shadowy and uneven, filled with rolling hills and mountain peaks and low valleys. Lakes glimmer in the moonlight. The dark blurs of forest stretch out as far as the eye can see. And somewhere ahead lie the volcanoes, surrounded by fields of hardened lava, as well as solid glaciers as tall and as thick as the mountains. I lean forward, trying to peer over Lilia's head to see where we're going, and something tugs sharply on my hair. I glance back at Ari, who looks apologetic. You didn't hear me over the wind, he shouts. And even though he's sitting right behind me, it's still difficult to hear him clearly. Sorry, I say back, raising my voice. What's wrong? He cuffs his hands around his mouth. We need to get her to land. She's never flown this far before. If she keeps going, she'll get too tired to take us back. Oops. I didn't think of that, but I should have. I'm still not sure why Ari is so concerned about Lilia being in the realm, though. He hasn't told me why she isn't supposed to be here in the first place, and I can't think of a good reason. Ari yells something else, but his words are snatched away by the wind. What? I shout back, leaning closer in his direction. I said we have to get you back before your parents wake up. He's right. I hate it, but he's right. What will Mama and Papa think if they wake up and I'm not in bed? And what could I possibly tell them to explain where I went? If Mama finds out, she'll never let me become a seeker. We have a few hours, at most, to see the realm before we have to take Lilia back to the beach and return to the village. How do we get her to land? I ask. We need to guide her the way the Seekers do. Right. I should have thought of that, too. I turn around, close my eyes, and reach for my magic. Within seconds, Lilia's energy surrounds me, as bright as ever. I give her life spark a tiny nudge with my gift, urging her to fly lower. She turns her head slightly, snorts, and proceeds to ignore me. Lilia, I say, gritting my teeth as I try to keep a grip on my gift. Don't be stubborn. Come on, let's check out what's on the ground. I give her another nudge. Something warm and soft brushes up against my magic. The yellow light of Ari's gift blends with the green of mine and the silver spark of Lilia's life force. It feels like a soothing sip of tea after a long day or curling up under warm blankets at night. It's somehow heavy and cozy all at once, and my eyelids almost droop in response. Lilia's energy gets noticeably dimmer, like she's getting sleepy too. Then I understand what Ari's trying to do, make her sleepy so she'll want to land and rest for a while. It's a good idea, but it's working too well. You're overdoing it, I yell. She's going to get too sleepy before she can land, and so am I. I think Ari yells sorry, but it's hard to tell. His magic pulls back from mine a bit, and I give Lilia a firmer nudge with my gift. She turns her head again, hesitates, then angles her body towards the ground, flying lower. I open my eyes and grip her spine tightly as we descend. Only now does it occur to me that Lilia might not know how to land, since she's never done this before. We might be about to crash. As Lilia drops lower, a new sound is audible over the wind, a thunderous roar below us. I lean forward, trying to see around Lilia's wings, and catch a glimpse of the ground, or rather, a glimpse of water. Lilia is aiming for a wide clearing surrounded by a lake. At the far end, sorry, surrounding a lake, at the far end of the clearing, towering cliffs drop off and a massive waterfall cascades from the rocks, the water plummeting to the lake below. The roar of the waterfall is getting louder and louder as we descend, and I give Lilia a nudge with my gift, encouraging her to turn in the direction of shore so she can land smoothly. But Lilia snorts again and ignores me. As we drop through the air, she passes right over the shoreline and heads straight toward the lake. Ari figures it out at the same moment I do. She's headed for the water! At this point, we're descending too fast for me to try coaxing her anywhere with my magic. It's too late. Hold your breath, I yell. I suck in a gulp of air as Lilia dives into the lake and water rushes up to meet us. I try to hold onto her back, but it's no use. 
The impact sends me spinning, water rushing all around. I open my eyes, but it's so dark, and the water is so turbulent that I can't see anything. I reach for my gift. Lilia's life force is somewhere below me. There are small sparks everywhere, probably fish and plants, but it feels like there are trees above me. I start swimming, aiming for those sparks. The surface has got to be somewhere up there. My lungs burn. I swim faster, straining for the surface, trying desperately not to inhale water and choke. The water churns. It's so cold that every part of me feels numb. I need air. I rise what must be six feet, my limbs thrashing, my magic flung in every direction seeking the surface. Surface. I can't breathe. Lilia's life force is suddenly engulfing me, and something hard presses against my back, propelling me to the surface. In seconds, I rise through the water, and the surface breaks around me. I gulp for air, gasping and sputtering. Something solid rests beneath my back, lifting me out of the lake. I blink water from my eyes, but it's hard to make anything out in the darkness. The waterfall is still somewhere behind me, and its roar is muffled by all the water clogging my ears. I wrap my arms around my chest, shivering with cold. Bryn? A voice calls. Bryn, are you okay? There's so much magical energy around me, more than I've ever felt before, that it's making my head spin. Carefully, I pull my gift closer to myself, trying not to sense so much at once. Then, just like I did the first time I met Lilia, I had to get her used, I, and had to get used to her spark, I release a tiny tendril of my gift. The feeling of magic is still incredibly overwhelming, but there isn't any one source. It's like it's in the air around me, and the earth, and the water. Of course, I'm in the wild realm now, the source of all magic. This is what the realm feels like. As I regain my breath, I release a little more magic. The now familiar feeling of Lilia is below me, as if... Oh, I'm sitting on her nose. I glance down. Her silver scales are bright in the moonlight and shimmering with water. I'm sitting directly on her snout, legs dangling off. Lilia must have pushed me up to the surface with her head. Bryn! I look around again, and this time the shadows come into focus. A figure stands on the edge of the lake, not clear enough to actually see, but from that funny empath life source feeling, it must be Ari. It occurs to me that he's been shouting my name for a while. I'm okay, I yell back, immediately followed by a cough. Recovering my breath, I slide carefully off Lilia's nose and into the water. The dragon's yellow eyes are wide as she looks at me. Thanks, Lil, I say, but no more water landings from now on, okay? She taps me with the end of her snout, nudging me toward the edge of the lake. It's okay, I say. I'm all right. But now that I think about it, I am very very cold. I turn away from Lilia and swim to shore. Ari waits at the edge and offers me a hand up when I reach the embankment. I let him pull me to my feet and then stop to catch my breath again. Like me, Ari's drenched. Water drips from his curls and he's taken off his heavy waterlogged coat. Are you okay? He asks. I couldn't find you in the water and then when you took so long to surface... Lilia found me, I say quickly. That's twice tonight that I've felt embarrassed in front of Ari. I really shouldn't be showing my competitors what a bad swimmer I am. The fact that he got to the surface perfectly fine on his own makes it worse. To distract myself from the embarrassment, I shrug off my coat and wring it out as best I can, water puddling at my feet. Fat droplets fall from the end of my braid, and my boots are soaked all the way through, as well as the rest of my clothing. I quickly put my coat back on. Even in the summertime, and not really that far north, it's still much colder up here in the highlands than it is in the village, and the water is absolutely frigid. I have to hope that the flight back home will help dry me off, because Mama will certainly notice if I'm still soaking wet when she wakes up. Maybe I can hide these clothes somewhere. Well, Ari says, interrupting my thoughts, this is it. I follow his gaze. The black surface of the lake shimmers with pinpricks of light from the stars above. Only the curve of Lilia's back and the top of her head are visible above the surface. The waterfall towers what must be a hundred feet above us, pouring over the jagged cliffs. 
A clearing stretches off to our right, filled with flowers and bordered by tall, thick trees. And framing everything are the sharp peaks of the mountains in the distance, with the sea lying somewhere below them. It is the most beautiful landscape I've ever seen. We really are in the wild realm. Look, Bryn, Ari says, pointing across the lake. A dozen tiny pinpricks of light are flashing in and out. Fireflies. I wonder what else might be around here, I say. As pretty as fireflies are, they're common outside the realm, too, and I want to see something magical. I wish it weren't so dark, I add. Then we could see more. I let my gift shine brightly around my fingertips, trying to illuminate as much as I can, and glance toward the clearing, where I can just barely make out the shapes of flowers in the distance. I wonder if... I walk away from Ari, winding around the edge of the lake and heading into the grassy clearing. I call my gift to my fingertips, letting its green light shine as brightly as I can to illuminate the ground in front of me. Most of the plants look and feel, with the sense of my gift, like ordinary non-magical plants. Wild thyme, arctic poppies, and what looks like purple saxifrage and mountain avens are grouped together, along with bunches of white-tipped cotton grass and dandelions. But I sense a few clusters of flowers with stronger, more magical life forces, plants infused with the magic of the realm that can only grow here. Fireflies cluster nearer these plants than any of the others. I step close to one of them, my wet boots squelching, and lean in for a better inspection. Fairy clovers, I whisper, my eyes widening. They're fragile little plants, <clears throat> with short stems and four wide leaves that, according to legend, look like fairy wings. The fairy bit is probably nonsense. Papa says fairies have never been spotted in the realm, contrary to legend. But I do know that if you chop up a handful and mix them with herbs, you can make a magic tonic that cures headaches. I've seen the village herbalist give Papa a whole bottle of Mama's favorite skin ointment or two flasks of salt in exchange for only a handful of these clovers. Did you find something? Ari calls, coming up from behind me. I tense. For a second, I'm defensive. I found the clovers, and I don't want to share them. But that isn't really fair. Without Ari, I'd never have flown here in the first place, and there are more than enough plants here for both of us. Fairy clovers, I explain, pointing. I reach into my coat and search my pockets for the knife Papa gave me for my eleventh birthday. The herbalist will make a good trade for those. We can't, Ari says. I stop digging through my pocket, looking up at him. What are you talking about? They're right here. Think about it, Bryn. Neither of us is a seeker yet. Neither of us is supposed to be here. You can't just march into the herbalist shop with a handful of fairy clovers. How will you explain how you got them? I shrug. I can just say that Papa had them for a while. He still trades things he found in the realm sometimes. But even as I say it, I know Ari's right. If Papa had found clovers in the realm years ago, they'd be dried and yellowed after being plucked from their roots. Their magic would have faded. These are bright and fresh and brimming with life. With great reluctance, I step back. Fine, we won't take the clovers, but I really need to find some more star flowers. Not to trade, but for medicine. Will you help me look? I expect him to refuse for some reason, but he doesn't. Of course. Where do star flowers usually grow? They're forest flowers, right? I hate that he knows this. Yes, I don't actually think we'll see any this far south. Papa says they're most common in the northern forests, but they do bloom at night, so now's the perfect time to try and spot some, just in case. We have to hurry, Ari says, but we can look for a bit. He glances back at the lake where Lilia has disappeared under the surface. She's hunting, I think, so she'll be fine for a while. Should we let her do that? I ask. We don't want her to eat any magical creatures in the lake. Well, yeah, but we must be within the dragon's normal territory. Otherwise, Lilia wouldn't even be able to enter this part of the realm. If the Seekers haven't put up a boundary spell to keep the dragons away, then it must be okay for her to hunt here. A fair, non-competitive person would probably say that Ari had made a smart observation. I'm not that person. Whatever, I guess we can look for a minute. Leaving the fairy clovers behind, we circle around the clearing, not wanting to trample the flowers, and reach the tree line. 
A tangle of trees towers ten feet above our heads. Beyond them, there's nothing but darkness. Ari and I exchange a glance, but he looks sharply away. And without a word, we step forward at the same time to enter one of the forests of the realm.